to acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and my colleagues and I are grateful to live and work on this land. So today I'm here to talk about lessons for the long term. That's not just the title of my report, it's the key reason for investigating long-term care and my resulting recommendations. Je suis ici aujourd'hui pour parler des leçons sur le long terme. Il ne s'agit pas que du titre de mon rapport, c'est aussi la principale raison de mon enquête sur les soins de longue durée et mes recommandations qui en découlent. More than 4,000 long-term care residents and 13 staff members died from COVID during the first two years of the pandemic, almost 2,000 of them in the first few months. Long-term care residents account for one-third of Ontario's death toll during COVID. Now, that's a disproportionate impact on a vulnerable segment of our society. I'm aware that there have been other reviews and reports about the devastating effects of COVID-19 on long-term care in this province. However, our investigation did not duplicate the work of other reviews. Rather, we focused on the Ministry of Long-Term Care's inspections branch, and we uncovered evidence that was not previously revealed about how this important oversight function collapsed when COVID hit. I have made 76 recommendations, all aimed at ensuring that this province is better prepared to protect long-term care residents and staff when the next health emergency arrives. I'm pleased to report that all of my recommendations have been accepted, and the Ministry has pledged to report back to me on a regular basis on its progress in implementing them. J'ai fait 66 recommandations visant toutes à mieux préparer la province à protéger les résidents et résidentes et le personnel. I've made 76 recommendations, all aimed at ensuring this province is better prepared to protect long-term care residents and staff when the next health emergency arrives. I'm pleased to report that all my recommendations have been accepted and the ministry has pledged to report back to me on a regular basis on its program in implementation. Le rapport analyse très bien. However, the evidence we gathered reveals that the challenges of COVID completely overwhelmed it. Our investigation identified problems with nearly every aspect of the inspection branch's processes during the first COVID wave. The ministry had no plan or guidelines for how to do inspections during a pandemic. So none were done for seven weeks, even as reports of outbreaks and health risks to residents and staff inside the homes poured in. Inspectors did not have access to personal protective equipment or training in infection prevention and control. Many were directed to contact long-term care homes by phone and take on more of a supportive role than an investigative one. They relied entirely on self-reporting by the homes. We discovered that extremely serious COVID-related issues such as infection prevention and control or personal equipment, protective equipment usage were not inspected in a timely manner or at all. The inspections branch also did little or often nothing when homes did file reports about COVID-19 outbreaks. Even when the inspections resumed and violations of the law were found, the inspections branch often took the least severe enforcement action available, even in serious situations. Homes were given many months to fix significant issues that posed a serious risk of harm to residents, and the action taken was often documented in confusing or poorly written reports. The direct result of the lack of inspections, reports, and enforcement was a lack of protection for residents and staff and a lack of accountability for the system. Le résultat direct du manque d'inspection. The direct result of the lack of inspections, reports, and enforcement was a lack of protection for residents and staff and a lack of accountability to the system. I've included in this report some stories from families of residents who tried in vain to get the ministry to respond to their concerns about the conditions within the homes that their loved ones were living in. Several of these residents died before anything was done. For example, Peter complained three times about the lack of COVID infection control and his mother's worsening conditions at the home. And again, after she died, an inspection was not done for six months. Rahim complained three times about a home's lack of COVID infection control, putting both his parents at risk. His father died and his mother was hospitalized. The ministry ultimately 
The ministry ultimately inspected the home, but took more than two months to issue an inspection report. We also described some disturbing cases where, based on a review of the inspection reports, homes were not penalized to the extent that they could have been, despite repeated findings of non-compliance. Now, the good news is that in addition to accepting my recommendation, the ministry has already made several improvements. It now has a new policy that provides for training, communications, and PPE across the province in case of a pandemic, and a checklist to follow when it happens. However, there is still work to do. Among other things, it remains to be seen whether inspectors and the ministry will take enforcement action when appropriate. Now, the ministry's goal should always be to confirm that long-term care homes are complying with legislated requirements and to act quickly when they don't. L'objectif du ministère devrait toujours de vérifier la conformité des... The ministry's goal should always be to confirm that long-term care homes are complying with legislative requirements and act quickly when they don't must be the primary mission of the branch and reflected in its work culture. It's also crucial that the government strengthen the long-term care sector's ability to respond to crisis by ensuring that there are enough inspectors and by revising legislation to expand the circumstances in which homes must report critical incidents. Homes should not be relieved of their, of their responsibility to properly document resident care, even in emergencies. COVID-19 has not gone away and it will not be Ontario's last pandemic. I'm hopeful that if my recommendations are implemented and the province remains committed to remembering the lessons from this experience, it will be ready when the next threat arrives. Long-term care staff, residents, their loved ones, and all Ontarians deserve nothing less. Je reprendrai maintenant à vos questions. I'll be happy to take your questions now. This current government cut back on uh, long-term care inspections when they took office in 2018, I believe. Did, did you find that that led to uh, more issues during the pandemic? So what we found was that uh, the inspection system was always already strained before COVID hit, and it had been that way for a long time. There were some homes that were in, in non-compliance. Um, and so what's the, at the core of this this investigation is inspections, because to to effectively oversee a system you have to have inspections. You know, you think of the, the CRA uh, enforcing the Income Tax Act. They do, they do audits, right? You can't take people's word for how things are being done. And so at the core of the ministry's oversight responsibility is the inspection function. And what we found that it was just not ready for this. It was already strained before the pandemic, but it was not ready. Didn't have a plan, didn't have sufficient people um, to, to do those inspections. So because we've... Cut back off. Well, they've, they've hired more since then, so what we focused on was the situation from um, June 20th, or well, actually, March 20th forward, so the, the, the beginning of the inspection, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, rather. What was the most egregious thing you saw during your investigation? Well, I think that, you know, we, we, we tell the stories of, of severe cases of outbreaks that were being uh, signaled uh, to, to the inspections branch, and there was a lack of action, a lack of appropriate action, um, and people weren't going into the homes for a long period of time. Uh, and then when the inspections did resume, um, some of the homes were let off quite easily. And when you look at the, the scale of sanctions that could have been imposed, um, they were often given the, the least onerous sanctions or given time to fix things rather than really facing tough sanctions. It was a, it was a terrible time and there was a lot of fear. Yeah. Were inspectors refusing to go in and expose themselves? Like what was going on and did the government allow that? So yes, some inspectors did refuse to go in, and uh, the union took a stance to try and protect its its members, and that's you know that's their role. Um, the problem, though, was not the refusal or or the the, the actions of the inspectors' union. The problem was that the system wasn't there to enable inspections to happen in a safe and effective manner. That's what we're talking about, and that's what we address in the recommendations, is being prepared the next time. So having inspectors, having enough inspectors to go around, having inspectors with uh, training and infection and control, having inspectors that are trained in the use of PPE, uh, and so that they have those protections. You know, they, it, they're entitled to a safe workplace too. So we saw the horrifying stories, and we've heard the horrifying stories of when, when Canada had to send in, the, the government had to send in forces. Okay. Um, could that have been avoided if there were proper inspections earlier on? 
Well, that's that's speculation. I can't speculate on that. But what I would hope is going forward that wouldn't have to happen in the future. That if we had a, a proper inspection regime, you had enough inspectors who were properly trained, that had the PPE, that work with uh, public health units in partnership, um, those kind of things would not be necessary in the future. That's the hope. So the alarm bells weren't ringing soon enough because there were no inspectors to send out. A lot the of things were a lot of things were being missed, and we highlighted in the report, and I've cited some of those examples. Um, you know, loved ones were, were, as you say, it was a terrible time, and um, a lot of things were being um, notified to the inspectors' branch. And what we found was that either they were unable to act, or they didn't have a plan to act in a timely manner. Did you find a difference between the um, for-profit homes versus the not-for-profit? We didn't look at that, and you know what we focused on is, is inspections, and you know the inspection regime should be the same for profit or non-profit homes, and so that's the, so there was no that was not a focus of our investigation. Were they the same between profit and non-profit homes when it came to how the inspectors responded? As, as far as I know, yes. As far as I know, the the, you know, the the breakdown of the system, the lack of inspections was across the board, and the problems that we signaled were across the board. Mr. Dubé, do you think if there had been more inspections that some of the tragedies could have been avoided? Again, uh, speculation, but, you know, you, you have to wonder, right? Like this, there were no inspections for seven weeks. During those seven weeks, 720 people died in, in homes. Uh, I'm sure that they can't all be attributed to COVID, but uh, you'd like to think that with um, adequate inspections, with rigorous inspections, with rigorous enforcement of the regulations, that uh, safety would be optimized for residents and staff. I, I'm, I was curious too about um, the lack of knowledge just from senior government officials about what was going on. You said this was, in a report you talk about it being limited to pretty much the inspection branch was the only branch of government that seemed to know that this had been paused. So what did the political side know about what was happening in their in the long-term care homes? Well, the political side is not the focus of our investigation. You know, we look at administrative um, issues. We look at uh, sound administration and, and, uh, and fairness. Uh, and so that was the focus, right, is, is what the bureaucracy, how the bureaucracy responded, how the bureaucracy was prepared, how the inspections branch. Uh, basically, it's the oversight of the ministry of the inspections function. And, um, you know, I'll say it again, you, you, you can't have effective oversight and enforce compliance with regulations if you don't do adequate inspections. And that's what we saw break down during but COVID. I think you also said, though, some senior government officials on the bureaucracy side didn't even know that this was going on. Yeah, so one of the things we call for, and it's in the recommendations, right, that there be more oversight to file management, that managers be more involved, that, that there's a more, that there are more eyes on these reports and, and, and more people involved in decisions on what the sanctions should be to maximize enforcement. How did they not know? Well, um, you know, the, 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 there's ways that the ra files were handled and things were kept in isolation at times, I'm sure. So that's what we're calling for is more transparency, more accountability, and more people involved in the review internally of those files so that the, the decisions are not made in isolation. And I think that's just sound governance and sound practice. With winter on the horizon, flu season, expected increase in COVID cases, um, what recommendations would you like the ministry to address sooner rather than later that they haven't already? Well, um, you know, I, the, the report is being released today. We don't have the six-month report back yet. Um, you know, we hear that they're hiring more, that they have, have hired more inspectors. There's a new law, um, new, new rules, but... Um, it remains to be seen with what vigor the inspections are carried out and what kind of enforcement uh, is imposed when um, shortcomings are found. So uh, it's my hope, and that's why we were anxious to get this report out um, and, and get these recommendations and um, being acted upon, because you're right, uh, winter is coming, COVID is still around, and uh, it's a concern. We have uh, heard... Uh, okay. okay. Uh, we have heard others detail uh, this real breakdown in inspections, whether it's during the first wave of COVID or continuing today, mm -hmm. like, isn't this stuff that the government should have acted on a long time ago? The COVID has been going on. I mean, it started, you know, this is more than three years later. Well, and we had SARS, right? And there were lessons to be learned from SARS. And I think this is why, this is what we focused on when we chose the title for this report. Let's take this opportunity to learn some lessons 
right? Let's 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 improve situation. Let's improve preparation so that the next time a pandemic hits, uh, that the province is more prepared in long-term care to handle it, to keep residents safe, to keep staff, staff safe, uh, and to keep uh, you know death and illness to a minimum. Your report talks about dehydration and neglect and malnutrition at, at times. Um, did you ever find proof that this happened in any of the homes, residents dying not necessarily because of COVID? But so I don't have oversight of long-term care, right? Uh, I have oversight of the ministry. So the patient ombudsman uh, looked into the patient experience or the resident experience, if you will. So that was not within the purview of our review. So what we focused on was how well the ministry uh, through its inspections, was overseeing long-term care, and were they doing enough to protect uh, the health and safety of residents and staff? And so the answer was no. Uh, the conclusion that we came to was no. Um, and for the reasons I cited, that uh, there, was, there was no plan to conduct inspections when a pandemic hit. Inspectors stopped inspecting for long periods of time. They feared for their own safety, understandably. There was a lack of uh, PPE available to them. They didn't have the training in infection prevention and control, and, uh, and and there was a discord. And there was and one of the things we recommend is there should be more collaboration with public health. Uh, and the, and then when inspections were done, um, you know some of the homes that that uh, that had violations were were not written up very seriously or very uh, sanctioned very severely in the way they could have. So I think that all of those things will improve the system, will improve the inspections regime, will improve the oversight of the ministry, and we're hopeful that that would lead to better, uh, more health and safety, better outcomes. In there the was a ministry inspection uh, specifically called when the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, parts of the reports outlining de 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 dehydration and neglect of deaths at two homes in particular, and then the ministry then went and conducted an investigation into those and uh, those reports from the Canadian Armed Forces. This happened way after the first wave. I was wondering if your report, I don't see it in here, but did you look at that inspection that they did? Well, it's pr we, looked at, we looked at all the files that we could during that period of time. I have to say that the, the Canadian Armed Forces didn't really issue a report, right? They, they sent a letter. An internal report. An, an, an internal letter and what, one of the things we found was that they did not communicate to the ministry uh, in an effective way all of their findings, right, that, uh, that is required under the legislation. So the Canadian Armed Forces weren't really briefed. And, you know, but we did look at that and we reviewed that. That was actually the impetus for launching this investigation when we read those accounts. Uh, some of those accounts have been sort of retracted to a degree. Um, you know, they were based on opinion and not necessarily evidence. So, uh, but, you know, it, w it was an important um, catalyst for us to launch this investigation, definitely. On something entirely different, um, there's a bit in here about the decision to launch a new computer program that delayed the issuing of reports to homes. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, because that seemed a remarkable thing to do in the middle of a massive crisis. Well, you know, work work doesn't stop when the pandemic hits. You 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 rearrange your priorities, you reorder your priorities. But I think that if the determination was made that uh, a, you know better IT support or new new system would would enhance things, um, you know the work does, was it was decided that the work on that would continue. So I think that, you know that was an effort to improve uh, the the system. Is that what delayed though issuing reports to long term care homes for months? That's what the report seems to say. Well, I can't I can't pin it all to that. I mean, the, the lack of inspections resulted in a lack of reports. Right, that was the most important thing. You mentioned that there was no PPE for inspectors. Is that not a government responsibility? Where I know there was a shortage of PPE, but was there a lack of awareness of what was necessary in these long-term care homes to protect inspectors and staff? Um, were all the resources going to hospitals instead, for example? Well, I don't know how resources were diverted. I just know that the plan was lacking. The plan to, to continue to conduct inspections during a pandemic was lacking. There were no guidelines on how, when, and where to do it, and how to equip uh, inspectors, to how to ensure that they were properly trained. And those are the things that we address in our recommendations. Was there even an attempt by the government to, to coordinate one during that time? That you well, I don't know. I can't speak to that. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. When we were look, you were mentioning earlier that a lot of times the um, uh, 
the reprimand or at least guidance or enforcement that would have been done was the the least a lot of times the least of any reprimand to the point where it seemed to be key messaging was being uh, relayed by phone instead because that seems that, that was the best could be done. But when you were looking, did you see um, any time where this leniency was potentially given because of the staff themselves being overwhelmed and it not necessarily and more so I don't know if if uh, empathy is the right word, but. Yeah. They were. This was, as Cynthia, Cynthia mentioned, it was a very confusing and very fearful time. Absolutely. Look, I can't speculate. I can't uh, speculate on people's motivations. We just look at the evidence. What the evidence that we saw when we looked through inspection uh, reports was that uh, when you matched up the problems that were found and the issues and the risks that were identified, and you looked at the sanctions or the enforcement action that was taken, it was pretty low on the scale of what could have been, and it raised questions about whether it was at the appropriate level, but I can't speak to people's motivations or uh, what their thought process was. Was there ever a time where you thought, uh, looking back, there should have been an occasion where that, I believe at the beginning, and it was in the executive summary you were mentioning, just the, 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 the nth degree that you could go to about uh, having essentially not the charter be uh, put in someone else's name, but someone else would be, uh, be put in for managerial purposes. Did you ever see a time where that could have been warranted? Well, I think, I can't speak to that either, but what I, what I can tell you is that the trans, transition from inspection role to kind of a support role um, was not really serving the interest of residents and staff. That I don't think that optimized safety, right? Um, calling people on the phone and, and, and asking how things were and then offering support to the homes uh, by phone. Um, that's that's not really an effective oversight role, and so we, we found that to be problematic. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. your interest Thank in this. You.